What's up, everybody? How you doing? I love you guys for coming <laughs> to our session. Thank you. We appreciate it. Welcome to Beats the Billboards. I am a batch on the CEO and founder of BeatStars.com. I've got three amazing creators and guests with us on this panel coming from different places on this earth with different stories and different journeys and different results. I wanted to first introduce our first panelist, Israel. He's a Grammy award-winning producer who has worked with some of the biggest names in the music industry like Drake and Future. His innovative and original sound has garnered him critical acclaim and numerous accolades. Not only is he a talented producer, but he is also a skilled executive producer and a master of curating the perfect sound for people when they're in the stew. Let's give it up for Israel, everybody. Yeah, I appreciate that, I appreciate y'all. Now introducing Kavi, a rising music producer and sample maker who has made a name for himself on BeatStars, selling his unique sounds to some of the biggest names in the music industry. Kavi's success story is an inspiration to all aspiring music producers and entrepreneurs from using the collab feature on BeatStars to building a loyal fan base. Kavi has proven that dedication, hard work, creativity can go a long way. His guerrilla marketing approach to production and business has made him one of the most sought after producers in the game. And at just 20 years old, has built a multi six figure dollar business online. Welcome to South by Southwest, Kavi. Thank you. And then ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Shima, is a rising star in the music industry known for her unique blend of electronic dance and pop music. As a talented artist, producer, DJ, and engineer, she has garnered a significant following on social media platforms such as TikTok and Instagram, where she showcases her musical prowess through visually stunning content, which has helped her land a partnership with Universal Music Japan. Her success on BeatStars, where she sells her beats and vocal samples, has also caught the attention of so many aspiring independent artists and producers looking to establish themselves. We are thrilled to have her here today to share her insights and experience on being a multilingual artist in the digital age. Give it up for Shima, y'all. Appreciate it, appreciate it, guys. I'm gonna jump right in to the creative process, which also includes like collaboration. Israel, I'm gonna start with you, man. You're the producer of this crazy song that came out last year, some point? April 29th, 2022, exactly. 2022, and one of the most like memorable things about that song is the beat. Like people use that beat as an instrumental solo on like Instagram and TikTok and use it as a background music for a lot of different things. But that song won you a Grammy and it features some of the most amazing artists, Drake, Tim's, and future. Can you tell us a little bit how that song came together, man? How did it come together? And just give us the backstory on it. Indeed, I can actually. To be real with you guys, like it just all came together really just perfectly. I was doing a lot of work with Thames on the live tip, more of just like recomposing certain records, just like working with the team to figure out how we could make certain things sound, how they need to sound for her live performances. She had a record called Higher and Muiwa, her manager, just called me one day. I was like, yo, can you pull up? We had no practice. I didn't even know what I was doing. To be honest, I didn't even know what I was doing when we pulled up. We got there, and my guy Sonic Major was like, yo, I seen him. Like, oh, what's up, man? And they told us, okay, we're going to recompose higher. Okay, what is that? Even? Like, you can you could have told us that ahead of time. So I pulled Sonic aside, and I was just like, yo, like, this is what we're going to do. And the original song, I just had to change the chord progression on it add some drop sixes just to make it move a little bit. Cause if we're gonna have two instruments on this record, like we have to make it make sense. We got off in two trials, I'm gonna say like two takes. We just went in, killed it. I just started freestyling certain things and they loved it. So we kept it. And then funny enough, I want to say probably six months after, funny story. I'm glad we got the business done afterwards, but I was literally in a point in my life where I was like, of course, you guys know the Genius Live released the actual video on YouTube. And I, like a few months later, like I was in a point where I was like, all right, I'm gonna just listen to positive music for a while. But, like the whole future toxic thing, I was like, I'm cool. And I was in a group chat with my friends. They just kept on sending this song and they're like, yo, this is the best song on the album. I'm like, 
I'm just skipping it. You know how like on text messages you can click the play button? I'm just skipping it. I'm like, man, I'm cool, I'm cool. Probably by the, cause it's like 30 of us in a group chat. Probably by the 12th person who put it in there, I clicked play. It took half a second for me to know. Oh, hold on. Still didn't hit yet. I left it alone for a little second. And then probably two days later, something clicked in me. We got the business done, reached out to who we had to reach out to, close it out. And now that's what we have. Wait for you. ATL Jacob, FNZ originally found uh, the video on YouTube. And FNZ sent it to ATL Jacob. ATL Jacob threw some drums on it, played it for future. And it was a wrap from there. Amazing. Congratulations, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Kavi, you've got like a similar story too with two songs. I think they dropped like the same week almost. The same day. Same night. Same day. So Beautiful by DJ Khaled and Scissor in Future and then Beat the Odds, Lil TJ. And it was like, I, I don't know. I remember that day, the whole producer community just went nuts on Instagram. They're like, Kavi's having a day right now. Kavi's having yeah. a day right now. Both these songs came out. What was your reaction when those songs, both those songs came out? And did you know about them coming out? And how did it all come together? So, Beautiful was, I don't know if you guys know who TM88 is, but he found me on Instagram through one of my, so I make samples, I make loops, like unfinished melodic ideas for other producers to flip and add drums to. And I run ads on Instagram for the loop kits that I drop. And TM88 got one of my ads just randomly. He hit me up and got his email, whatever. I sent him loops for a year. Didn't hear anything. Emailing him every day, like probably hundreds of loops. And then one day he just called me. I was at the store and he was like, yo, we got one on Khaled's album. And I was like, I hear stuff like that all the time. So I was like, oh, that's cool. But then Khaled started like really pushing it. Like the whole God did. And the track was dropped. And I knew the vocal it was like said beautiful over. And then I saw beautiful future in SZA and I was like, crazy, can't believe it, whatever. Cause this is my first major song and it's with an artist that I really respect and really wanted to work with. So that dropped and I knew that one was coming on that night. But then TJ posted Beat the Odds or whatever and he had just been shot like a couple months ago. I was in the hospital, right? Yeah. And that one, I had been sitting on that for a while. I had no idea it was gonna drop. Honestly, I wasn't even excited about that because I was so hype about Future that night. But yeah, that beat was just a YouTube beat. So I post, I don't directly post, but I collaborate with a bunch of big producers on YouTube. And TJ found the beat on YouTube, rapped on it. And then that was literally it. I didn't send it to anyone. Similar story. It's just on YouTube, someone found it, used it, and then got put out there. And now it's... That's my biggest song by far, Beat the Oz with TJ. Amazing, man. That's awesome. Congratulations, too. Appreciate it. And there's, I, you guys were telling me something last night. There's, I guess, a story that I don't know if I was fully aware of it, but I didn't know you guys were actually, you, you guys have collaborated on something, but you and Shima actually worked on something together that ended up being a pretty big Latin track, right? Yeah, we have. Uh, me and Shima have been working together for two years now. I found her from a BeatStars interview on Instagram. And I was looking for vocalists to work with. And I was like, damn, she's got the craziest vocals. I'm looking for stuff like this. Hit her up, we just started working. We started putting out like collab loop kits together. And one of them was on a YouTube beat, again, a BeatStars YouTube beat. And some Latin guy that I've never heard of picked it up. And now it's a platinum song, like with, I think it's Omi De Oro, Neo Garcia and Jay Wheeler. And yeah, that song went crazy. So yeah, just more random stuff that I got from pushing my stuff out online. Amazing, amazing. And then I wanna get into Shima here, who is a triple threat or a quadruple threat. She does everything from singing, songwriting, DJing, producing, engineering, <laughs> directing videos. You pretty much are just a full spectrum creative. And and it's been amazing to see your journey start from being this social media person showcasing their talent and then turning that into a real a career and releasing music with Universal Music Japan. And one of the songs that you had released, which is still one of my favorite songs in the last year or so, is Con Man, which is like the ultimate 
female empowerment like song and he collaborated with Sum- Sumire, Sum- Sumire Sumire who's also a super really big popular artist in Japan and and you guys dropped like a crazy music video to it anyway can you t- tell me a little bit about how that song came together and then that collaboration and it what led up to getting to the Universal Japan folks and like actually having a major release out there so yeah this was during the pandemic I I'm living in LA and I was living in LA at the time and Sumi is a close friend who is also like a successful actress and singer in Japan and she just reached out to me in one day and was like let's work on a track she saw all the content I was putting out and you know it was like okay she's making moves let's make a track I'm really into Dua Lipa right now so can we do a Dua Lipa style track so I made a beat and I sent it to her and she liked it. I wrote the rest of the song. I did it half in Japanese, half in English. Like most of my stuff is bilingual. And then I flew to Japan. We recorded the song. We recorded most of the vocals like actually at her house. I brought my mic and interface with me. And then we recorded at her house, finished it up in a studio. And we really just did everything ourselves. And then I'm signed with Universal Music Japan. So we released it through them and yeah. And I think another really cool, unique story about you and your journey is that you also started out as a software engineer, working within the music production world in the digital audio workstations and plug-in world. Did any of that technical type of experience, how are you applying that today to your business that you're running right now, this digital business that you're running right now? That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah. So before the pandemic and before I became a full time producer and artist, I was a software engineer and I worked at Splice and then I worked at Output as a dev and we basically made plugins. So I think making plugins and knowing how they work from the inside, of course, it made me know how to use them better. And I think the mindset of approaching things from like an engineering perspective Now, when I sit down and I make a song, of course, it's a creative process, but there's a lot of like reverse engineering involved as well, where you hear a song that you like and you can pick apart all the different elements and then reconstruct it. So I think the way that it's helped the most is like the mindset from which I approach creative things now is from more of a step by step process. Yeah super technical right music is technical it's all ones and zeros when you really think about it in in terms of the software now israel like i want to talk to you because music is constantly changing man and you're the type of producer now that okay now you've got that sound and this song that is in history now one of the dopest songs of this era and this panel is called beats the billboards right so the guy that's taken a maybe a different approach than Kavi in the online entrepreneur world, and it then a different approach than Shima from the recording artist world, but you're embodying like what it means to be that traditional executive producer in the room. That's your aspiration, that's who you're that's what you're doing now and you're putting it into practice. How do you constantly figure out how to not follow just the trends of what's happening in all these LA studios and still bring in your way of work and you're not conforming to just whatever trends that are happening in traditional music. The best way I can put that is a will can attest. I'm pretty hard headed. I think it just comes down to trusting your ear, not about making what you feel like this person wants. I'd be quick to turn down a session or I'll be in a session. I'm, I'll be quick to not even want to work with the artists again if I feel like the freedom of expression isn't there. I'm just trusting your ear, like all the things that you've grown up in, all the things you used to listen to, all the music you used to try to play when you were learning, like all those things that make you who you are. So it's not until you tap into that and you stop overthinking and you just do it. That's how I don't really think about, okay, what's going on? You know what I mean? I just, whatever comes to me, oh, I played this chorus, sounds good, okay, cool, let's leave it. You know what I mean? And as you create the track, you start realizing that it's like a step at a time, it's not six foot hops. Okay, cool. You know how many times I started a record and I was like, when I didn't trust myself, I was like, and I stopped it, and I came back to that same record like six months later, and I was like, oh, this is crazy. You know what I mean? So once I got out of that, I started trusting myself and trusting who I am, how I came up, my upbringing. I, was... I want to talk about your upbringing a little bit because I feel like yeah. 
when we spoke behind the scenes about growing up in the church, orchestrating what's happening in terms of a church band and being a part of an ensemble, being a part of a group, being a part of a band, and taking all that you learned with having to perform live at church and what you've taught, and I know you can speak on your mom too and her musical influences, has that enabled you to be able to control a room in a studio and all the different pieces to make sure that not these, because I could, man, listen, LA is LA, right? Sometimes these sessions get inefficient. They don't want to really get things done. And your drive, I'm saying your way of organization may be like, oh, but you being able to do that, you're holding the room accountable. You feel like that church upbringing has been able to help you in that way? Oh, for sure, in many different ways, first of all. Can I really talk to y'all real quick? All right, so boom. I grew up, I'm Nigerian born, like born in Nigeria, like my life is, I'm a Nigerian man to the fullest. So my upbringing, speaking on my mom, my mom used to be a pretty heavy gospel singer in Nigeria, very well known. And my dad used to play drums for Fela Kuti, so it was like, when I was growing up, it was just like music. Like even before I knew what a studio was, I just remember my mom having me in this super cold room with all this equipment. I'm like four years old, five years old, pissed, ready to go home, like making a fit. Like she'd have to spank me, you know what I mean? Like for real, like all jokes aside. And then also growing up in a place where my mom was always some type of choir director at every church we went to. So it was like, I was the kid that had to be at church Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. It's from like 10 to eight at night. So after they'd finished practicing or whatever, I'd be the kid while they were talking in the meeting rooms, I'd be the kid just going through the instruments and, you know what I'm saying, playing with it. Even to the point where they thought something was wrong with me because at the church that I grew up in, like it was a known thing for the kids, the little kids, to find their way in the choir, start with the small instruments like the cowbells and like the shakers and then just work your way up to the, cause I'm Nigerian, it was like a Nigerian church. So work your way up to the Congos. So I feel like all of that overall just made me like, trust myself so are we going somewhere it's, yo we could need something and even if we don't have something we need an idea and all of that built up to where we at building up and sparking that creativity with that man i love it kavi i'd love for you to speak on your approach to the business part because it's essentially very different than what these guys are doing and you really have embraced and embodied this e-commerce entrepreneur flood the streets with content and have a couple magical moments happen, right? And, and believe in yourself. So tell me a little bit about the different types of collaborations that you do that really fuel what your business is all about and, uh, and how has that been successful for you? So the main kind of collaboration that I do is like the samples, the loops. I send that out to other bigger producers who have all their connections. And I don't know if it's the best way to look at it, but the way I think of it is I make I like the source material, like the starting point for a song or a finished beat. And instead of being limited to how many people I can reach out to and try to get it to and all that, it's if I can get my source material to as many people and work with as many people as I can, they will do all that work for me and stuff will come back to me. So that's how the future song came about. That's how TJ, that's how all of my placements, I haven't been, like these guys are in sessions and stuff. Like I've never really been in a real set. Everything is just at my house, put my stuff out to the world and then let my work speak for itself and other people push it to all the people they know and stuff yeah, like that. But there's a million sample makers out there, right? There's people making samples and trying to sell them, trying to sell these packs here and sell packs here. Everyone's trying to sell a pack. Everyone's trying to sell a pack. You're 20 years old and are you at a point now where it's like you're more focused on selling these packs and getting these sales to people? Or are you more focused on, you know what, I'm going to let these packs fly in all these studios for free, possibly strategically. What are, where is your focus in, in, in that strategy? Is it more about building a, a, a sample pack business, selling it, or more focused on strategically working with guys like Israel, like Shima, throwing packs, throwing packs their way, getting them content so you could feed their creative abilities too? The way I look at it is the placements, the cool songs. Maybe my mind will change if I get a hit like Israel, like wait for you. But it's more like a 
I treat it as like my bonus. Like I'm not counting on that because it's too unpredictable. I know that if I'm working on my online business, I can make this amount if I put in this amount of work on the right things. To answer your question, I'm more focused on building the business of that and then having those big songs be the byproduct of me building my own brand up because then people are finding my stuff. I don't have to find the people to work with. They come to me and it's just, a, that's what's worked for me. How long did it take for you to feel like, okay, I can actually put sounds together and sell them? You I've know. been trying to do it since I was like 16. I just, I grew up like with beat stars and YouTube type beats and stuff. And I was friends with a bunch of other teenagers who were doing it. And I was just like, everyone was putting out their kits and running in Instagram ads on it. But once I really got good at making music, that's the key. You could have all the right strategies, but if your music isn't tight, it's, nothing is going to work. You have to market it super hard to get it to sell. But if it's good, then it's easy to sell. So yeah. once, once I got that, everything clicked. And then at that point, it's just consistency. Yeah. And then being a creator nowadays, guys, it's like, it's a full-time gig. It's a full-time gig. Like balancing life, balancing creativity and the business is so many different, so many different moving parts. She might being a do you you mix as well too, right? You're mixing your, all your own stuff. Yeah. But like being a mix engineer is an art by itself. It's really like a skill that needs to be honed in and developed on over and over. And you're trying to hone in on all these other skills too, and all these other products and all these other things that you're trying to do. How do you figure out a way to balance like the creative stuff, the artist DJ stuff, and mixing all the all of these different roles, and then also balance it with the business stuff too? Like how do you balance all of that? So actually my main focus is my artist project, making and releasing my own music. But like in the process of doing that, I come up with all sorts of byproducts. If I'm working on a track, I might come up with five different hook ideas and settle with one. And so the remaining four hook ideas I can that I've recorded already, they're just like sitting on my hard drive. Or if I'm, yeah, working on the beat, I might make three different iterations of the beat before I settle on the final one. So it doesn't feel as much like I'm doing a bunch of different things. I feel like I'm doing one thing and then maximizing that into as many different products as possible. A lot of like the leftover vocals that I've recorded that didn't end up making it in the final track, I'll bundle it up and give it to Kavi or sell it as a vocal pack or chop it up and turn it into a total different loop or sample or something. Yeah. So I, I think it looks like I'm doing way more than I am. <laughs> You're definitely maximizing all the content and using pieces of it. That's great. And that's a great way to approach it. Nothing should be wasted or thrown away. Yeah, exactly. But you've also have been this awesome content creator. And you were just showing me last night this video of a remix of a Doja Cat song that you did on TikTok that had millions and millions of views. Now, how have you been able to leverage those kind of platforms to showcase your talent? put out these remixes and then with these remixes or all that content are you also utilizing some of that content that's made from some of those things for other things too or is it is that all part of the same family of things or like how does it work yeah so a lot of my like little tiktok and real videos that i post are just me like performing my own music on the push just playing a little beat or singing or Sometimes it's mashups of other people's music, but I was so resistant to getting into that at first because I was like, why do I have to make content? I'm not a YouTuber. I'm not a TikToker. I don't want to make content. I resisted it for so long. But once I started doing it, I realized the opportunities that come from that have been like those videos have brought me more opportunities than any single release song release that I've released on Spotify or whatever. I, it's just the market nowadays and you can either adapt to it and embrace it and make it a strength of yours or you can ignore it and then you're not utilizing a tool that's there available for you that's free there's not a lot of female producers out there showcasing their work and you say you're putting it out there but is there any other do you think do you point to any other reasons why like folks just gravitated to that, to the content. Was there anything like you did strategically to f make it go the way it goes? Yeah, actually low key, uh, one of the reasons why I started posting those videos was because I was like releasing, making and releasing my own music. And a lot of people just didn't believe that I was doing it myself. So I was like, okay, if I literally physically sit down and play the beat, 
and oh, people can see me doing it. No one can deny that it's actually my boyfriend making the beat or something like that. So I, that was another reason for doing it. I, I'm also hoping that like other women and young girls will see that and be like, oh, if she's doing it, I can totally do it too. Have you seen that response from young uh, girls yeah, that yeah. are like, are they, you seeing them in Doesn't the Doesn't look as scary as or intimidating if seeing another like person like me doing it. That's awesome. That's awesome. For sure. Israel, I want to talk about balance too and management and being able to like, you've got all these moving pieces, these sessions, these things, these press, the, you've got, you're building a brand and I don't know how much focus you are putting on for social media content. I don't know how much focus you're focusing on that, but would love to hear like, where's your priority structure right now? What are, how are you balancing all of these different things and making sure that you're not being overwhelmed as a creator, as a business owner with all these different opportunities, how you pick and choose what to work on, how do you schedule yourself? What are, yeah, I'd love to hear like your organizational structure to get to your goals. Okay, to keep it 100% with you, I feel like I just go at my pace. Like I don't put the anxiety on myself to be like, oh, I gotta, yeah, I gotta shoot out a thousand beats. I don't do that. All I do is I trust the fact that, look, when I sit down every morning, so usually, let me tell you what my morning looks like. I wake up. I try not to touch my phone. As soon as I get up, get in the shower, I eat, probably sit on my laptop, start like a melody ideas that's on my head. Or most times it's, I'm just chilling. During the day, if I'm not doing anything, I'd literally just put that audio file into Ableton and then remake what I did with my mouth with instruments. And then I just do that occasionally, randomly. And then if I'm in random sessions, most times I like, I just work on sessions and how I feel. I don't put the pressure on myself. Honestly, and it just, it's been working out. I love the using your vocal there. I saw, I'm pretty sure I saw some kind of software recently that you can do that and turn that into a MIDI immediately into the DAW. Because you, you played around. I think it's Vocally, vo yeah. Vocalio, Vocalio. I haven't tried it yet. I, that, you might want to get that probably. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope. Copy. You're probably like the more active digital entrepreneur on this stage right now because you're putting out so much damn content. I can't keep up with you, dude. Slow down, like chill, but it's working, but it's okay. Yeah. Don't burn yourself out. But I would love to hear like, how do you balance also massively putting out that much content and then make time to release all of that stuff every week and like, put it out and feed all your customers and your followers. Like, how are you doing that at 20 years old, man? I'll be honest, it's hard as hell. It just, it definitely takes a toll on me mentally just having my brain in so many things because I'm making the music, selling it, making content, writing the script for the content, whatever, all that stuff. But what I've been doing recently that really has helped me is when I try to work on everything in one day, it get, my mind is I'm trying to make a melody, but I'm also worried about the business and then this content that needs to go out. And I just, I can't do anything because I'm so overwhelmed with everything that's going on. So I'll start, I started like blocking my schedule. So like I'll have a day. The only thing I'm doing is making melodies. I'm not worried about anything else. I'm fully like artist, producer mode, whatever. And then the next day, all I'm doing is recording YouTube videos, YouTube content and all that, and I can focus on making that as good as I can, send that to my editor. The next day I'm working on just the business stuff, all that, so doing stuff that way has really helped me separate it. And I've seen like people who do daily content on TikTok and Reels and stuff, they don't sit there and make the content every day fresh and then post it. They're like, they'll sit down for a day, make 10 videos and do that three times a month. So it only takes three days a month to make the whole content for the whole month. So just blocking stuff like that really helps me. So having like theme days, yes. theme days around one real like big body of work, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Yep. It's, and then I also plan it out on my calendar, like what needs to get done each week, how many days I need to make music, how many days I need to do this. And so I do it that way. The epitome of just like, cons like consistency will work consistency will just eventually will block out all of the noise that's out there. And whether you like it or not, Kavi is going to be on your feed, on your YouTube feed, on your Beastars feed, whatever or not, your Instagram feed is where do you get that from? Because not a lot of young, I got my kids back there, man. I'm teaching them consistency and I'm trying to tell them they got to get to work every day. I, whatever craft they're trying to get into. 
And where did you inherit that kind of grind working ethic? Did did someone was someone in your family that influenced you to be that way? I grew up playing sports, so I think I, I don't know if competitive mindset is the right word, but before I was making music, I had no other plan in life other than I was going to be an NHL player. So that was the only thing that was going to work for me. And then I found beats and quit that immediately. But, and from there, I was like, I'm going to be famous, be the next Metro Boomin, whatever. But honestly, I think the consistency, when I started, I was in high school, so I wasn't as serious, but I was still doing it every day. But the consistency that I've found over the past couple of years when I've gone super hard on it, I saw a little bit of success. And it's just addicting to see like the growth in the next month more, make more sales, do this. And then it's just like constantly chasing that high of reaching different levels, but also an insecurity of this could be taken away from me at any moment if I stop because someone else will take, someone else is going to be doing the work that I'm not doing. So it's like someone taking a spot on the hockey team. It's like yeah. you had to keep that competitiveness similar to what Dilly got at bumping was playing competitive basketball and it's that, that daily work ethic translated into other parts of his life so that's dope to see that sports can do that see kids sports yeah sports um, shima i want to get back to your music videos and i still can't believe sometimes when you tell me like you're putting together the creative the wardrobe the shots the scenes <laughs> you're really like visualizing what these music videos could end up looking like and from just from the consumer perspective i'm looking at these videos i'm like oh she probably had a massive crew this is like huge production and I'm seeing so many more and more young people get more creative with how they can use video to translate and tell their story. I'd love for you to share a little bit, just a little bit like video content creation, music video creation. How expensive does that get for you? What does that investment turn into for you? And how did you get into that? I guess when I release music, I kind of started to look at it as you're not just releasing a piece of audio you're releasing a full package product with cover art and a music video and a theme and even things like when i sit down and i start working on a track i'm already thinking about what's the color palette of this track what's the accompanying visual going to be like because it's really more than a song that you release is more than a piece of audio it's it's really a full product once you start approaching it from that angle the moment you are working on the music, you start getting ideas for music videos or different types of art and things like that. And so, for example, for the con man one, the lyrics are telling a very specific story. So I started thinking of like a music video concept that would go with that story. And the budget for that video was about the equivalent of 2,500 US dollars. What? Nothing. That gets you like a videographer, basically. <laughs> Barely. So we did all kinds of crazy things to hack that video. I went to a store and bought all the clothes, like all the wardrobe, and then kept the tags on and then returned it the next day after the video shoot. We had another friend who like has a clothing brand. She has her own clothing brand. So we did like a partnership. Hey, we'll promote your clothes in the video if you like let us borrow it. Same with a friend who had like his own bar. So we were like, can we film it in your bar and we'll promote your bar and we can like film at your place for free. And it was like things like that, all kinds of just friends helping each other out. And same with the videographer. He ended up working at a very discounted rate because he was getting to put his name on the big artist Sumi rate. And for him, that was like a great thing to have on his resume. And I was like, I can't pay you a lot. I don't really have a budget. And he's, that's fine. I want to do this. And yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how you're able to utilize as many resources as you can to make it happen. And you probably are like still thinking about ways you could have made that the video even yeah. better. You need yeah. a lot of money yeah. to make a good video. Yeah. Because a lot of artists and producers, they get stuck with, oh, I need this and I need this person on my team and I need this to happen. Or, I need all of these things before I can actually get in the lab and cook, before I can actually like ask myself, what will it take for me to execute on this idea? You know what I mean? Can I actually yeah. bounce off of which something she just said is actually really heavy? She said that when you release records, it's not just an audio file. I was just talking to Kavi, yes, was it yesterday or today, where if you think about it, every record you release is a new house you just bought or built. It's real estate. It's intellectual property. So it's like the same way how if you want to buy a house, you're going to make sure you're in the right market, the right time. You're going to make sure you have the right contractor if you want to build a house. It's the same way... Like when you release a song, 
figure out what market you wanted in. You figure out how to get to those people. When you want to make the music, shoot the music video, and figure out, okay, what, like, what's your vision for it? Same way if you buy a house. And if you think about it that way, that just helps you with the business too. You start understanding publishing, you start understanding the power of publishing master and like how building those, even if it's a song, even if you feel like you have no, you just got started making music. Every song has value. Like I've seen people who probably only made three songs in their life, make the fourth song and the fourth song just got placed for a sync. That's like 60 bands. You see what I'm saying? Just wanted to add. I love that, and I want to get into that because that's like a lot of the reasons why we're sitting here today is that you have taken the steps to start collecting on those intellectual pieces of property, right? Those things that you own. And I think a lot of producers get a little bit, once you start talking about music publishing, they get glossy eyed. They don't want to, they don't understand it. They don't want to start learning that there's a whole new world of royalties that are sitting there for them. And they got to go out and get it. They got to figure out how to go out and get it. Because a lot of times I'm hearing stories with you guys that, oh, the label didn't credit me here, or this didn't happen here. And the producer journey to go collect the royalties, sometimes it can be challenging compared to the recording artist when you're when you're distributing yourself on the master side. What if Kavi and, and Israel, you start first. What are some challenges that you've had with getting your stuff credited and properly collecting on the songs that you own? be real with you, I never have that problem because... It just depends on how aggressive you're willing to be. Like, I'm, when we're doing business, we could be cool on the side, but if we're doing business, I'm not here to be your friend. That's not what I'm here to be. Like, because we had a conversation, we had a dinner, I'm not going to put my business aside for you. You know what I mean? You just have to know anything you make, you own. And that there's a natural copyright. I don't care who you think you are, what company it is. So if you're aggressive enough to be like, but aggressive, but fair. Aggressive, but likable. You don't have to be agreeable, but be a good person. But go for it. Okay, look, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to need this and this. That's the first option, or this and this will happen, and that does not benefit anybody. And I promise you, I promise you, if you stay stiff, you'll get exactly what you wanted. I promise. Kavi, do you feel like there could be some improvement with how like the music industry is crediting and making sure that producers are getting their fair share, or do you feel like the system is working for you right now too? I think the system is working for me right now, but only because I have Greg, Mike, I have a whole team around me that's helping me and navigating me through this stuff. But if I was by myself, there's so many layers to it. Israel understands it a lot more than I do. I used to... I always see the good in people and I'm very trusting, but like he said, nobody's friends whenever it comes down to the business. So my best advice would just be have some people in your corner who can guide you through that because otherwise you get ran over. It's brutal. Wink, B stars publishing. Yep. Sima, I want to talk about how to stay motivated and overcoming creative blocks. I'm a creator. I know like we were just talking in the green room about these blocks sometimes and knowing when to throw things away and when to come back to them or when to revisit, when to do things. I'd love to hear, how do you stay motivated to push through some of those creative blocks and not just like completely give up, or completely give up the next day or the week after? Like, how do you get through those moments to overcome them? I think nowadays a lot of people are like bedroom producers. So they're like sitting alone in their room all day, like not talking to a single soul. And it's easy to get sucked into that vacuum and hit a wall and not know how to move forward. I think for me, what's really helped is in those moments, just reach out to other people. I'll just send a half-baked idea to my friends and be like, you got any ideas for this? They might give me feedback or even add something to it and send it back. So I think having a community of people who you can like bounce ideas off of and build things with is especially important for like bedroom producer type people like me because I'm just really just at home by myself all day. And if you don't have that yet, just something as simple as just taking a step away from your own stuff and like listening to someone else's album or listening to something totally different or consume as much music as you can from as many different sources as you can. And for me, like that always gives me ideas. Have you guys know what broadcast channels are? So like Telegram has the ability to create a broadcast channel and Instagram just recently rolled out broadcast channels as well too. And what, how they're formatted is you, the creator, are pushing content into this channel 
and your followers and fans can give feedback and like things and do things and stuff like that. It's like your own dedicated little social media feed for your fans. Anyway, just putting that out there, that that could be a great way to have your loyal your loyal folks in a room, basically, whenever you need to share feedback. I've seen artists, bigger artists, put a lot of rough drafts in their, in their broadcast channels, getting feedback on rough pieces of songs or snippets and just to see what the temperature's like with the people. And I thought that was pretty dope. For me, I think that's like Discord. Yeah, Discord. when I say find a community, it doesn't even have to be like in real life. Yeah. yeah, I met these guys on Discord. And there's so many little producer communities and channels on Discord where people just send whips back and forth and like give each other feedback. And sometimes you have like really veteran producers in those channels, like just giving you really solid feedback and then that you suddenly you know what to do next. But don't sleep on Discord. It's crazy. I've got my Discord server. We've got like 5,000 people in it. And it's it's crazy. I just started it just because people were asking me to do it. But now I'm seeing like people connect and get placements. Like people who don't even know who I am join it just to be in the community. And it's crazy. Everyone's helping each other out. I think definitely like finding a community is super helpful, especially when you're not in LA, you can't be in the room with these people. And yeah, it just helps to have like-minded people around you. Sure, Discord is so powerful, super powerful. The only thing I don't like about all these platforms though, is that they don't share the user information. So like you drove 5,000 people into this Discord channel, you don't have access to their emails, their information, to be able to like include them into an even closer private community, whether that's like an SMS group or other things. like. We've seen time and time again, all these social platforms will limit your ability to reach your fans and your customers after time. It's always in the beginning. It's like open for all. You could reach everyone. You could talk to everyone. And then, oh, you got to start paying ad money to reach your folks. Yep. And running an independent business, Kavi, like, how do you combat that? Like, how do you, how are you controlling the communication between you and your fans and your supporters and your customers without the need of social platforms? That's a tough question. I feel like I'm not really trying to battle against the social platforms. And I don't know if I'm trying to directly communicate exactly like with my customers, which maybe I should be, but with everything I put out, I'm mentally just thinking like, how can I put more value out than I'm asking for in return? When I put out a video, I could do the whole like, oh, this is how you make $100,000 selling beats by my course for the real information, whatever. But I'm just giving out everything I know on all my videos and in return I've built like a big community of people who just really respect everything that I've got going on just because I'm being honest and giving more value than I'm asking for in return and it comes back. Yeah. Yeah, they're tapped in, they're on with you right now, but there will come a time where it would be amazing to have 10,000 phone numbers or 10,000 email addresses when you go town to town and when you start doing gigs or when you start doing anything to where you can like control oh, well, or email I, addresses. I have, you know? I have, yeah, I have an email list for 10,000. We have, only have eight minutes left, seven minutes left. We want to open up for Q and A. So at anyone that wants to ask these guys some questions, would love for you guys to just line up behind that microphone right there and ask away. We'll spend the rest of the time answering you guys. All right, cool. I will say I'm going to answer anything, like any questions, music, yeah, business. Anything. If you got a record that they didn't pay you for, you're like, yo, how can I get my money? Like, anything what's up is i'm mainly in a film composer and tv composer but some of the most rewarding things i've done recently is actually collaborations with some edm producers you guys are you were splice that so you probably know kashmir and kara so i work with them and those are really cool and rewarding and i want to do more of that so what do you recommend for someone like me who's pretty outside especially hip-hop but other genres as well outside the genre to connect with people that way that might want a more from what I did with Kashmir was like cinematic scoring for his live shows and I did that and stuff like that I feel like because you're outside of the genre you might actually have an edge because you're offering something that they can't do themselves so I feel like I if I were you I would step into that and just make it fit their world. Do you have a, I guess what I'm looking for is what is the bridge do you think though? Like, what do you think is a good way for me to show that skill set that they don't, maybe they're not even aware that they want that as part of what they do? What I would do is, honestly, it goes back to what he was saying about providing value. What you don't realize is you're looking for their value to get in that, 
And a lot of them are looking for your values to get into what you do. So what I would do is I'd cross market that. I'd be like, hey, yo, you ever thought about getting into sync? Boom. You guys work together. You help them get syncs. And you're like, yo, you start sending them your own separate packs. And you never know. Like it goes also as to what he said. You said, your, what's your, your strength again? Scoring. Scoring. Yeah, so done a lot. Film and TV. Okay, so you might add that cinematic edge to their production, and you guys could just meet each other halfway. Also, I run a sync company by the name of Syncland, and we actually like place very frequently, so I'd love to get your information that we could speak from there. What's up, guys? My name's, my name's Nick Thompson. So my question is for Shima, actually. When you, so you, you're a music video creator in addition to being a producer and all these other things. One of my questions is basically like, when you create music videos, how do you conceptualize the ideas for them? And when you make music also, like, where's your first step in the creative process? Like, how do you start out with that? I don't really have like a go-to first step but oftentimes for me, it starts with chords. Once I find a chord progression that I really like, that for me is, okay, now we have something to build on. I know for a lot of people, it's like the drums first or melody first or whatever, but for me, it's all about the harmony and that kind of determines the mood. And then, I don't know, it goes hand in hand. I'll get little visual ideas of what would look good with this music. And then you can start big and you can start throwing out different ideas and then once you have all the different ideas that you want then you can start to get a little realistic about okay this is how much money i actually have this is the people or the equipment or the locations that i have available to me and then narrow it down from there that's fire awesome thank you could i add to what she just said real quick before my brain goes blank she says she starts with melody. That's so important. An old mentor of mine told me, you have a record if you can take the drums out and it still sounds good and you can just keep listening to it. Because then the drums are just extra. Because think about it. If you're at a live performance, whether it's a rapper or a singer, what's the main instrument you need? Is It's not just going to be only drums and a singer. Like that doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? But you could have a rapper and a keyboardist or a rapper and a guitarist or a singer and a keyboardist, a singer and a guitarist. Like they built the world around that. That's why if you go back into like music back in the days, it used to be like the piano, the vocalist, and everything else was built around that. So I feel like if you just have that in mind, everything else will fall through. Thank you. Bro. Hey, y'all. My name is Kamari. I produce, I DJ as well. And I was just curious, I read this book called The War of Art recently, and it talks about resistance and some of the internal battles that all creators have to overcome. And I was just curious as to some of the internal things you guys had to overcome in order to make the reality of what it is now. Also, I watched your video, KX, and I've heard some of the things that you said, so. Appreciate it. Yeah. Internal battles as far as life? Yeah, life. I hate to be very straightforward, but bro, you just have to do it. I know that sounds very bland, but like, speaking on me, like, you just don't quit. I think the difference between the people, and I'm, I don't know everything. I'm still just working my way to where we need to get to, but just gotta know it, like me, for instance. Homeless in my car, making emails to go shower at LA Fitness in the morning, sneak into the neighborhood studio just to be there because I had nowhere else to go. You know what I mean? Just doing that for like, how long is it? It's either it's somewhere between eight months to a year. If it's any, if anybody in here is from Dallas, they probably like people. Also, you just bro, you just gotta do it, man, and then do it, but be around a good community of people. Like community is so important. Like we're human beings. Like we're meant to be in community. That's what that's our core you know what i mean so just do what you like to do find the right community loving community i promise you you tap into that you look back a year you're like oh yeah i see a huge difference yeah oh uh, yeah i think everyone i know who didn't quit who i started working with is doing something now it may not be the same level of success as other people but everyone who didn't stop for a year take a break consistency it's boring advice but it it's boring because it's true. It works. No, but also sometimes it you may go hard on writing music, performing music for 10 years, and then you're like, wait, hold on, but this is leading me into a different passion. That was my path. That was my path. I was r rapping in the 90s, 2000s, and then it got to the point where it's like this technology thing a little bit better. I like this, where I love all these different pieces, but I'm passionate about this now. And I sometimes all that stuff just leads into something else.
just leads into something else that you're meant to do. You just got to be open to saying, all right, God, take me where I'm meant to be. Yeah, I appreciate y'all. All right, these are the last questions here. Hey, y'all. My name is Morgan Franklin. I'm a global manager for Budweiser. And I have a question about sampling songs. So obviously, I know it's very expensive to sample a track or anything commercially driven and for songs in general. And we're toying with an idea of purchasing the open rights to some iconic tracks and giving them to producers around the world to make what they may of them. Budweiser? Awesome. <laughs> so my question is, we think it's a good idea, but as producers, is that something that would be seen to be a value to y'all? A hundred percent, yes. Immediately, yes. yes. <laughs> For sure. Definitely. Okay, that's good to know. Let us know. Let us know if you need a platform to kick it off. We can help you guys launch that out. I will get your information okay, and reach cool. out to you because cool. we know the democratization of samples is really difficult, right? And the power of samples is when somebody hears the beat and they feel like they know the song already, it makes a difference and it gives you more exposure and access. So I'll connect with y'all after. Thank you, Boris. Gus, thank you. My name is Anthony. I produce pop and rap music and such. I think Israel. I'm good friends with Mike over here. We were walking out of the club last night. We're the we're the ones that saw you. But so we try to make it today. What were you guys doing at the club last night? Nothing. We weren't doing anything. <laughs> so my question for you is when you're in the room with the artists, for example, the future is signed to Epic, right? So if you make the beat for him or you're working with ATL Jacob or whoever it is. Where does that payment come from? Are you doing a singular rate for the beat? And then, of course, you do the contracting for publishing on the back end. What does that process look like? And is it the label that pays you or is it the artist specifically? It comes out of their pocket. So it, it depends on how the business went. So let's say, let me give you an example. Say you made this record with somebody. It came out like before you knew about it. They didn't give you no paperwork. You just also have to understand, okay, what did you do on it? Okay, do you produce it by yourself? Yeah. Just yeah. ideally. Let's say you produce yeah. it by yourself. Just knowing your rights, naturally you own 50% publishing and depending on whether they're signed to a label or not, and the label owns their master, you own whatever that per that percentage, those points that they gave the artist, you own 50% of that, naturally. So if that's the case, yeah, I love it when you release the record first, please. Because what that does is it builds leverage now. You have a record that's, now you're not worried about the record not coming out. Yeah, let them release it. Cause then after that, what you do is you reach out. Yeah. Hello. We gotta wrap up. All right, so I'm about to wrap this up real quick. I can try to find you after too. All right, cool. I can knock it out in 30 seconds. So, you reach out to your lawyer. You tell them, yo, we need to reach out. You, depending on how aggressive you want to do, you can either try to talk to them if they ignore you. I'm a big advocate of copyright claims. I'm not gonna lie. You're not. I'm trying to tell you, you're not gonna play me. So what happens is, you reach out to Spotify. Spotify tells them, yo, you have 48 hours. We have this copyright claim. You can't, at that point, they can't get no syncs. They can't get anything because there's a copyright claim that's stopping anybody from making money. And then from that point, you just talk to them. You be fair. Don't be rough. Be a good person. Have a fair conversation. And at that point, when they see the money's on the line, if the song is down, it's down and nobody's making money. So then, you know, you just, you finish it that way. You guys just talk the business. Thank you, everybody. Please give these guys a round of applause. We appreciate y'all.